Hello. How are you? Hello. <laughs> I am good. Uh, thank you for having me. It's nice to be in your home, I think. This is, Maybe. yes, this is uh, my home and all my, all my weird uh, crap back here. It's awesome. funny. We I used to have like a like a, a big blanket here and it was uh, Blothar from Guar. He saw it and he thought that I had like killed a dog or something. So I actually managed to freak out uh, Blothar uh, from Guar. So little nice. little fun fact. For for the metal meltdown peeps watching right now, if you remember that, um, I just want to before we go forward, I want to say uh, big fan, been a big fan for a long time. I also wanted to make sure I understand that uh, with the WGA strike and the SAG after strike, uh, if I if I understand it correctly, there are certain things that you can't, certain questions you can't answer as a part of those strikes. Is that correct? Uh. Yeah, and I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I am trying to keep this conversation more about being a director of the movie, the writer of the movie, and uh, the music. So that's kind of what I'm focusing on. Okay. Uh, if if I if I end up asking a question that you feel uh, you can't answer because of the strikes, feel free to just let me know, and we'll move on. I don't want to I don't want to get you sure, in any unnecessary yeah. trouble. Yeah. Uh, with that in mind, good morning, metalheads of the internet. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Metal Meltdown. It's Brendan Small, co-creator of Metalocalypse, lead singer and guitarist for uh, Def Clock. He voices all your favorite characters on the show. Uh, and and on the note of that SAG AFTRA WGA uh, strike, I was actually curious: Have you been on the picket line at all? And how do you feel about uh, the entire movement? What I can say about what I can say about the um, the strike is that uh, you know the streamers need to come to the table and talk to the writers guild and they need to talk to all the guilds that I either participate in or don't and uh, the future of TV I think it needs to be sorted out with AI with metrics that are being hidden all that stuff so I I am very much uh, on uh, in simpatico with with what's going on uh, from all people from from every walk of entertainment uh, that's 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 searching for a deal. Uh, I don't know if you've seen on like social media. This is uh, especially on TikTok. There are a lot of people who will use AI programs to make like everyone from Eric Cartman and like SpongeBob or Joe Biden to sing like popular songs. Um, mm -hmm. And in regards to with AI being such a big thing, obviously in television and film, duh. But now it's kind of crossing over into music. Uh, I was wondering, like, how would you feel in general about somebody, say, using the voice of Nathan Explosion artificially to sing like an Ariana Grande song or or something like that? Like, how do you feel about AI's role in in music that way? Uh, you know, I I've heard about a lot of stuff. I've heard about you know people using different artists' voices on stuff, and uh, I haven't heard the music. Oh no, I think I saw a news cycle where they used the Weekends voice on something. And I, they didn't really play much of a sample of the music, so I couldn't tell if it was landing or anything. So I don't know. I really don't know what's going to go on with that stuff. I mean, um, AI is a uh, development tool. I understand the merits of that. Um, getting it to do your work for you. I don't understand why you're in this industry if you want something to just do your work for you. Why not just do it yourself? You know, I mean, because mm -hmm. what are we doing? If we're artists, we're we're trying to create something and use something uh, that we created. And I don't know. The reason I get up in the morning is to try to see if I can do something new that I haven't seen. So I'm I'm always wondering, you know, what 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 is there out there that hasn't been done? Rather than how can I reuse another artist's kind of likeness or their vo voice likeness or something like that? So I don't really just I don't think in those terms. Um, I have seen really cool stuff with Mid Journey that's really creative and funny. Um, I I preferred Mid Journey like three upgrades ago, where everything was kind of wrong, where they had extra fingers on the hands and mm -hmm. everything just looked a little eerie and weird to me. That was the most interesting thing in the world, just watching a computer misunderstand what a rib cage is or what bones are or what fingers are. That's way more interesting it's, than it it's so really funny because it makes it look like some like weird like unintentionally like some weird artsy painting or something like it's it's very odd. There was one person on Twitter uh, who was doing these kind of movies like these stills from movies that never existed like if 
Fellini made the Pac-Man movie or something like that. And that to me was like really strange and nightmarish and therefore totally interesting. I, I mean, I, there's kind of an interesting idea for like some like nightmare, nightmarish art exhibit, honestly, now that, now that you think about it that way. Oh, yeah. Some of my favorite art is described as nightmarish from music to, I don't know, H.R. Giger, who did, you know, the, the stuff from Alien. That's all nightmare. David oh, Lynch's yeah. work is nightmarish, and I love it for that reason. You know, the, the original Dune to me is one of the most nightmarish, gorgeous pieces that I've ever seen. So I don't know. I the dark side of me is always looking for that kind of strange nightmare that kind of like that is artistic. That that original Xenomorph design, especially uh, that H.R. Geiger from like the first Alien movie, that still creeps me out. Like that movie's yeah. what. Uh, 45 50 years old by now and i'm a grown man but that that still scares the crap out of me honestly it's uh, well it's it's a perfect combination of a great design a great story a great director great actors great music all that stuff yeah so everything's working in concert in the world of the original alien of course hell yeah uh going to def clock which i i assume a lot of people tuning into this that's what they want to hear about def clock yeah. has a brand new album uh coming out within the next couple of days uh a movie a soundtrack to that movie you're going on tour yeah. with baby metal in a month how does it yeah. feel to be back uh it's a little bit like um it's a strange feeling it's it's fun to play my guitar it's fun to make stuff i really like the whole reason i do this stuff is to make things and that's where i have all the fun the problem solving of being in production uh of directing of writing music um all that stuff is really how i have fun Touring is really fun, too, because I get to kind of have my cake and eat it where I get to be on stage, but I kind of get to be in the shadow. I get to sound like Death Clock, but I don't I'm not Death Clock. I'm just a person who Death Clock tells what to do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so you, really you are the to... avatar for uh, a Death Clock. I am for. Yeah. But that's how I kind of consider this whole project is from from the songs to the movie to everything else. It's let uh, I kind of disappear and they take over and they make the decisions and I. Again, I just work for them. I uh, I push the buttons. I play the guitar. I try to get the notes right and uh, try not to screw it up because uh, Nathan Explosion will get mad at me. Has Have you ever, like, every once in a while, have you ever looked out in the crowd and, and have, you, have you seen people kind of be like, that's not the guy from the show? Like, has there ever been that kind of reaction or do people, like, buy well, into it, know, like... No, it's it's. I think the hypnosis of a live show kind of takes over, and I think people are excited for this celebration of kind of all things metal Metalocalypse, all in one big place, you know. Mm -hmm. And the feeling of the live shows uh, initially, it's intended to feel like you're at like a like an amusement park ride, like like at the T two ride or something like that at Universal Studios or something, and that's what it's supposed to feel like. Now I'm there and I'm dressed in black and I'm kind of meant to be heard but not seen. But people are usually looking beyond me and watching the entertainment of the screen behind me because we play in front of a gigantic movie theater size screen mm -hmm. and uh, we're playing to picture and every downbeat is coinciding with the cut because Gene Hoagland, our drummer, is uh, driving this whole thing because he's got a click track running to his headset. And he, so he is his he, he articulates every single kind of movement and sound, you know, visually and and, and sonically. He's a uh, kind of the conductor and um and so yeah so people that's I, I try not to kind of be too physically apparent during this project because i don't think anyone needs to see me or wants to see me they want to be thinking about nathan explosion and squish car and pickles and murder face and the whole gang so so it's my job to kind of just be like i said yeah um the pit band that you kind of see on stage it's not about us it's about I always joke, you know, when we're about to go on stage, I say, look, we're not Death Clock. We're the Metalocalypse players, but we sound exactly like Death Clock. You're you're the you're the cover band filling in for the actual band. You're the we're not the cover band because we make the actual sounds in the studio, <laughs> but we, we just don't look like them. And and the fact that they don't exist is kind of like more interesting to me than than them existing. Uh, in in the show, there's often like graphic depictions of violence. Like people go to a Death Clock show and they're immediately like struck by lightning or flattened by a piece of equipment. Or mm -hmm. I don't know. In some cases, a cast member will literally like murder someone in the audience. I would hope you've never seen someone die at an actual show. 
but I am yeah, curious we, if yeah. you've ever seen something genuinely, truly chaotic and crazy, like what's depicted on the show in a, in a real concert. Well, that's where this, the whole idea of kind of, um, of, of doing that, it, it, that's where it all comes from. It comes from the fact that there are disasters at shows. There are stages fall. You know, we hear about news of a stage falling somewhere. Uh, Altamont, when the Rolling Stones played and there was, there was a stabbing there. There are different places. The who played somebody got smashed. Like there, this is what we do is we take the, what we see and we exaggerate it and we run it through a funhouse mirror. And that's usually every aspect of the show comes from something that exists in the world of heavy metal and music or celebrity. And we kind of just warp it and twist it. And, um, and death clock is, they're not murderers, but bad things happen. And they, and that's kind of what the show is. The show is, you know, the first episode is called The Curse of Death Clock. And we say that bad things happen around this band and mystical things happen around this band, too. Uh, I want to stress before I say this, this is a minority of people online saying this shit. And I don't agree with any of it for the record. But when you announced the tour with Baby Metal, I did read a few comments from a few like people that were like, Oh, Def Clock's going on tour with a Japanese girl pop band. What a bunch of posers. What a bunch of sellouts. How would you respond to that kind of comment, if at all? Um, I haven't heard it. So, I mean, the people that say that, I don't I don't know. I don't I don't have any response to it really because I know why I, I know why we're going on tour with them and I know what kind of a band they are. And what what we do and what they do, I could say is in the same boat because what we want to bring to the stage and what we have brought to the stage is something that's a little bit more theatrical. Uh, it's not something you're going to get at any other show. Again, we have picture and sound and a story in the world and characters and music and baby metal has taken heavy metal and uh, made it incredibly theatrical. They honor heavy metal and they're also adding to this, the conversation. I'd rather see something new than see something old. It's just like AI, like you mm -hmm. were saying earlier. Would you rather just see a regurgitation of something that has already existed or would you rather see something new? I wake up in the morning and the reason I'm creative is to try to add to the conversation rather than to try to copy it. You know, so um, somebody brought it up to me that that, oh, Metallica and baby metal and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, you know, I bet you that's, you know, the naysayers are louder. The people that enjoy it are, are quieter and just enjoy it you know yeah typically but, but there there are trolls everywhere you know um it's the internet think, what are you gonna uh, do what, eh what i think is important is what we're gonna do is give you a show that is probably gonna be the most entertaining show you're gonna see this year i'm gonna put us up, up against bands that are much bigger than us but we're gonna deliver entertainment and when you leave the show you're not gonna be able to wipe the smile off your face i believe that for the record i mean i've I've never seen Def Clock, but I do remember seeing Baby Metal. I think it was when they did their first North American tour. And they played mm -hmm. here in Toronto at the Danforth Music Hall. And it was just them for an hour and a half. And it was interesting because there were like all different kinds of people. Like you had people who looked like your stereotypical punks and metalheads. You had people like in like anime costumes and like cosplay and like regular people just off the street, like in khakis and mm -hmm. sandals. And it was totally bizarre and probably the most unique and interesting concert experience I've ever had. So for, I mean, for me, when I saw the Def Clock baby metal thing, I was like, Oh, chef's kiss. This just makes too much sense. I think it makes a ton of sense too. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the world that I live in. It's like, what is the world that makes sense to me? And what is the world that makes sense to both of us together as a, as a co-headliner? And that's, that's what we're doing. How do you feel that Def Clock has uh, progressed musically uh, since there was a Def Clock album? Because it's been about 11 years since Def Album 3 and I think 10 since the uh, Doomstar Requiem soundtrack. So so how would you say the band has changed, if at all? I think from every record um, that we've done or anything musical from the first song to the last song I've made for the TV show, um, the idea is to keep the DNA the same, but let it mutate and let it be what it wants to be. And in this case, for this this newer this newer album, it just ended up being heavier than anything we've done before and more aggressive than anything we've done. So we've kind of divided the album into 
two sides. One is this more heavy, aggressive side, and this other side being kind of bigger and more mystical and more expansive and more epic. So that's kind of that's kind of what Death Clock does. It, it honors a bunch of different kinds of styles, and from you know extreme metal to elements of hard rock to elements of rock opera. You know, it's just a bunch of crazy stuff all swirled together. And uh, no matter, I realize. I realize whatever it is that Death Clock wants to be, I can't stop it. It has to go. It just keeps happening. Whatever it is, I can't put the, a saddle on it or brakes on it. It has to become whatever it wants to be from 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 one record to the next. On on that note, uh, without talking specifically about the movie because of uh, the SAG after stuff, I have heard that this latest project is uh, supposed to be like the finale. With that in mind, is it fair to assume that this could be the last Def Clock album? Or, uh, as you said, like, could this just keep going and going and evolving? I really don't know. I mean, I just, look, I, I've just been working for, like, three years on, on this stuff. What happens after this? I have no idea. I didn't even know this was going to happen. Um, but I did, I was focused on making sure that uh, that this got to wrap up what the conversation that was started with the first episode. And that's that was the most important thing. I didn't want to leave another kind of open ended thing to find out that I you know don't have the finances to finish something else. I wanted to finish what we had to finish. So um, so that's what we did. I wanted to ask, too, in the show, there's this ongoing joke about Murderface starting a planet piss band. Has there ever been any legitimate discussion about doing like a planet piss EP or like a one off kind of thing? Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of side musical projects within this world there's dr roxo's whole world there's pickles had a oh, earlier shit, band i world forgot too. about dr roxo for a moment so they're like there's a lot of basically i you know i'm i'm a writer first and a performer second so that goes with acting that goes with guitar and um and what i think about music from the death clock albums to the peripheral projects in the show I think of it as world building and um, it just makes the world a little bit bigger to know that murder face, you know, he, first of all, he can't finish this project. Can he? Um, it has to be something that he'll never get around to. Mustn't it? But maybe he will. I don't know. Um, one crazy thing about that is that there was one song called taking it easy that showed up in an episode. And I got a call from somebody that represented the band Nashville pussy. And they asked if they could cover that song. And uh, I said, absolutely. So there, there is kind of a Planet Piss song that's kind of out in the zeitgeist. But it's uh, called Taking It Easy. And it's by Nashville Pussy. Their cover of a William Murder Face song. That's, I didn't even realize there was a band called Nash, Nashville Pussy. That's kind of incredible in and of itself. <laughs> They've been around for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I've got one more question for you and then I'll let you go. Uh, I, I imagine you're a busy guy. I just want to say thank you again for, for being patient with me and for, for even being here. Uh, Absolutely. if purely hypothetically Def Clock stops tomorrow or you just move on to something else, uh, would you consider maybe doing like another solo album, maybe a Galacticon part three? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Every time I finish a record, the same thing, when I finish it, when we get it done, when it's, you know, gotten to the place from mixing to mastering, I say to myself, well, I will never do that again. <laughs> That's what I say every single time because because uh, I think you always skate by from the skin of your teeth and make a project finish. Um, but uh, so I don't know. I'll have to be inspired. And often, you know, I'm not always sitting around writing music. I um, only when the project prompts me to do so. And Galacticon's always been this kind of thing where I wanted to do something else and then I ended up doing Galacticon. So even Galacticon 1, the first record, came from, uh, we were about to do Death Album 2. And I had rented a studio and I had gotten, you know, the co-producer Ulrich Wilde and I'd gotten Gene Hoagland ready to go. And we're getting ready and we're about to like start recording this record. And then I found out there was some kind of a problem with the contract and we had to kind of go back into either negotiations or finding out how something was going to work. And so I was put in a position of either canceling all this, the time and saying, sorry, Ulrich and sorry, Gene, I know you changed your schedule and refused other work to work on this. 
or I could just spend my own money and say, let's record something else. And that's what I did. I, I, I collected a bunch of songs that I thought were a little bit too melodic for death clock. And, and that's where Galacticon one came from. And I, and, and so I sat there with my guitars and Gene and recording studio. And we, we kind of worked out all these songs and then we got the uh, contracts negotiated and finished and we went right into the death album too. And then I was sitting there with all this money spent for these drums and these songs and these engineer. And I was like, Oh man, I got to finish this. I got to finish this Galacticon thing because, because I can't just sit around spending money and just leave it in a hard drive somewhere. I've got to do something with it. And so nobody compelled me to do it except for the fact that I was, I felt like a jerk for spending money and not finishing it. So I had to complete it. <laughs> unlike, unlike William Murderface, I had to complete the project. So, um, so that's where that was born. It was just kind of a cool place for me to go and uh, be creative in a different kind of landscape. But still, it's just as treacherous as making the Death Clock music. And, um, and uh, yeah, I just finished a record. So the last thing I wanted to do is get back in the studio and do another one. Totally fair. Uh, you got yeah. bigger, bigger things coming up with the tour and everything. So Absolutely, yeah. Well, thank you again for being here. It's It's been an absolute uh, pleasure to speak with you. I don't think my wife believed me when I told her that I would be interviewing you today. So uh, she's going to oh. get a kick out of this later on. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Brendan Small from Metalocalypse and Def Clock. Y'all know what to do. Pre- check out Def Clock. Listen to it if you haven't already. Press that button to subscribe. And as always, you have yourself a fantastic fucking day.